Thank you all for joining us today. Before we get started, we would like to honor the traditional owners and their custodianship of the land we are on today, wherever you are. Uh, we pay our respects to their ancestors and their descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connections to the country. In the context of agricultural and environmental systems, we recognize and respect the valuable contributions of, that Aboriginal and Torres Strait as Islander people play and continue to play as custodians of country and acknowledge that we still have much to learn. RAID is an active network of early and mid-career researchers with an interest in agriculture and international development. We support career development of early to mid-career researchers through targeted capacity building initiatives, networking events, and raising public awareness about career pathways into and the importance of international agriculture research for development. RAID is a program of the Crawford Fund and was established in December 2013 with the support of ACIAR, Australian Center for International Agricultural Research. Uh, we invite you to become a member of RAID. Um, and in our uh, note after this, that we'll send you all, we'll send a link uh, if you want any more information about the organization. Uh, today's webinar is entitled The Framing of Farming, uh, Regenerative Agriculture. Most of us have heard the term uh, regenerative agriculture. Uh, of course, that's why we're here. Uh, perhaps you've heard it and it inspired you, enraged you, confused you, um, or maybe a combination of the three. Today, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Ken Giller from Wageningen uh, University. Um, he's done an extensive amount of work of research on smallholder farming systems, uh, specifically on soil fertility in Sub-Saharan Africa, with an emphasis on the temporal and spatial dynamics of resources within crop uh, and livestock farming systems. He leads a number of initiatives such as Into Africa, putting nitrogen fixation to work for smallholder farmers in Africa. Uh, he is also the co-chair of the thematic network seven on sustainable agriculture and food systems of the sustainable De development solutions network of the UN um, and is a member of uh, the Un Unilever sustainable sourcing advisory board. He joins us today uh, to lead in what we hope will be a thought provoking discussion on regenerative agriculture. He recently uh, wrote a paper on the topic, uh, which we provided a link for in the Eventbrite, um, that's uh, sparked quite a lot of conversation uh, globally. Um, and we wanted to bring that to this webinar as well. Uh, we're excited uh, to welcome you all to the conversation mm -hmm. and ask that you come in with an open mind and think deeply about the topic for the next hour. Conversations about controversial topics like this have the potential to make us more thoughtful and effective members of the agricultural community. Uh, there will be plenty of time for questions at the end. Um, and with that, uh, thank you, Dr. Giller, again for joining us today. And I will turn it over to you. <clears throat> Thanks very much indeed, uh, Heather. And um, I think one of the very few benefits that we have of the pandemic these days is this opportunity to engage across the world in a way that we've not done in the past. So uh, great to be able to talk to all of you uh, on the other side of the world from my uh, small office at home where we're still in a semi lockdown, of course, like many of you also are, I think, these days. So I've, this paper, you were just talking about where did you hear about regenerative agriculture? For me, it was actually at a, a meeting of Unilever's Sustainable Sourcing Advisory Board when people started talking about regenerative agriculture. It's the end of 2019. I'm going, yeah, but what's this? So that was, in fact, the origin, really, of this, of this paper. I just have to make sure my slides are going to work. For some reason... Ah, here we are, they're advancing. So we see a lot of headlines like this. The World Economic Forum, our food system's broken. Here from The Guardian, the World Science Academy is saying that the food system's broken. 
what does that mean? I'm not sure. It must be true because it's in the Guardian and I read the Guardian. I, I believe what it says in the Guardian. So it must be true, but not sure what it means. And we ended up writing this paper then. And it was actually downloaded within the first two months more than 15,000 times. That's it's, uh, it's got this um, allometric uh, score of 183. I've never had so much interest in a paper that I've written in my life. It's published in a fairly obscure journal, Outlook on Agriculture, but actually a journal that we're trying to promote as a journal to actually encourage debate around agri agriculture. And I started it with this, this sen these sentences, agriculture in crisis, soil health collapsing, biodiversity facing the ma six mass extinction, crop fields plateauing. And against that narrative, we have this clarion call for regenerative agriculture. I've been heavily criticised for this opening as being overdramatic, but of course this is, in a sense, my sense of humour, if you like, which is maybe a peculiar English uh, form of irony. What is all this? What's going on? And that was basically why we started to write this paper. This is um, from Nexus Lexus. It's a, it's a search engine which tells you how many hits uh, topics had in the news. It surveys a huge number of different news sources. And you'll see from around 2016 onwards, it went through the roof. Huge amount of attention for this topic, regenerative agriculture. And it gained popularity with so many different organizations. We've got the big global NGOs, Nature Conservancy, World Wildlife Fund, Greenpeace, Friends of the Earth. But Alongside that, all of these multinationals, Danone, General Mills, Kellogg's, Patagonia, you name it, Unilever, Nestle, PepsiCo, the World Council for Sustainable Business Development, some charitable foundations, the IKEA Foundation, that's, uh, they make trendy furniture, I'm not sure if we have them down in, the, in, in Australia, um, and then many farmers, and actually many farmers, not particularly in Europe, but when you look around the internet, very much uh, large livestock farmers, people on large farms, particularly I see in Australia and, and New Zealand and in the USA. That was my tea just arriving actually. So, And let's have a look at that. Nature Conservancy, the revolution under our feet, a strong focus on soils. Greenpeace, a better way to farm, the regenerators. And then we've got Nestle, they've just invested 3 billion euros in the next five years to support regenerative agriculture transitions. We've got General Mills, 1 million hectares by 2030. Danone were one of the first actually to really get uh, active around regenerative agriculture and to promote regenerative models. Unilever have got their regenerative agriculture principles and also invested something in the order of 3 billion euros. Patagonia, the clothing company, into regenerative organic agriculture. And PepsiCo came on board more recently, again, with a, something in the order of 3 billion euro commitment to accelerating regenerative agriculture, strengthening farming communities. So all of these huge multinationals really pushing this bandwagon, if you like, as well. So we went back into the literature, as you do as an academic, and we had a look around, well, where does this term come from? And we found, actually, that the term was very popular in the early 1980s. So if you look at these, these bars here, this is regenerative agriculture or regenerative farming, very popular in the early 1980s, but then falling away, falling into disuse in the middle of the 2000s with other terms here such as sustainable agriculture really coming to the fore, but then picking up again more recently, as we said. So it's been around for quite some time. And we trace the real origins then to Robert Rodale of the Rodale Institute in the United States, which has really been, if you like, the home of organic agriculture in the US, looking at regenerative agriculture of increasing productivity, but increasing the land and soil biological base. So in increasing productivity, but in a way which actually builds soils and builds in the environment very much. And then this paper of Dick Harwood from 1983, actually in a rather obscure um, conference report from Tanzania, which I actually found I had in my library at home, 
where he's talking particularly about this idea of local and regional self-reliance, so closed nutrient loops. Now, from those origins, of course, we've come into a completely new situation now where the Rodale Institute's really a bit worried because they really feel that this has become a buzzword and we're in this situation where it's potentially being greenwashed and used by companies and people without actually the commitment to regenerative agriculture. So what is regenerative agriculture? Now we pulled together this table from different sources. Um, and essentially we, we've summarized them here into the basic principles and then some of the practices which are often mentioned. Now, many of these principles are very sensible. They're, they're very much what we think of as good agricultural practice, if you like, uh, minimizing tillage, maintaining soil cover, building soil carbon, maybe sequestering carbon, relying as much on biological nutrient cycles, fostering diversity, um, integrating livestock, avoiding pesticides, and then uh, making sure your water is percolating into soil. Most of these are principles that you think, well, that's good agricultural practice. But then sometimes the practices that are used or mentioned alongside those, I mean, some like agroforestry, ubiquitous across the world, but others, things like biochar, um, particularly the holistic grazing, uh, Alan Savory's uh, holistic grazing, things like um, uh, permaculture, culture comes out here very much, tend to think of, of more fringe, you know, compost tea, maybe doesn't have all of that broader applicability. And this very strong focus on the restoration of soil health, really a very, very big focus for soils these days, maybe which has gone a bit over the board, I feel at times, even though I come from a background focusing on soils and soil fertility, and not so much emphasis on this reversal of biodiversity loss. But when it comes down to it, it's, it, regenerative agriculture, it's a bit hard to pin down. But this big focus on soil, and here you'll see in the middle of this logo soup from this organization, The Carbon Underground, we've got this, uh, and I've lost control of my mouse for some reason. That's a bit annoying. In the middle of the logo soup, you'll see the Kiss the Ground, this, this uh, Netflix video that some of you might have watched. I watched it myself. I found it quite difficult, hard going, to be honest, because it's a form of populist journalism, which I think goes way over the top in many of the claims that it makes and is really quite misleading. But alongside this, Ben & Jerry's, Danone, all of these major companies, but then also the Rodale Institute and others all signing up to this organization, the Carbon Underground, looking then at sequestration of carbon. So here we have it, kiss the ground, healthy soil solves everything, healthy soil versus dead soil. And we come on to some of these rather obscure websites. This is one from a small university in Chico in uh, California. Welcome to the future of agriculture. Are you interested in learning more? Well, David Johnson has a fungal dominated compost, which can boost carbon sequestration. If you look at the bottom of the screen, you can capture 20 to 50 times the currently observed carbon increase in soils. It's hard to believe. In fact, it's extremely hard to believe. And it's all based on this little bioreactor system that he has, where you put on just two to three kilos of this fungal-based compost and you increase your soil carbon enormously. So when I see some of these things, I really start to wonder if the world's gone mad. And we have situations basically where companies, large companies are investing in these different approaches. Here we've got Dr. Elaine's soil food web approach, the essence of soil regeneration. 150% increase in crop production, 100% reduction in chemical inputs, reduction in irrigation needs, proof across six continents, 
and you can sign up for a foundation course for just $5,000. I've heard of people who've done this course as well. We've got the FU, the FAO, the magical world of soil biodiversity. They've now got a, a set of, I think it's 10 or 12 children's books on soil biodiversity. And then we start to see maybe some sense coming back into the argument. In the social media here, Civil Eats does overselling regenerative agriculture undermine its potential. Basically, there have been claims that from the carbon underground from Rodale, that if adopted everywhere, all of the problems of, of climate change could be solved simply through regenerative agriculture and soil carbon sequestration. But actually, most scientists would think that this is really far beyond its potential. Even people who've been promoting regenerative agriculture, such as Ratan Lal, the winner of the World Food Prize and others, as soil scientists promoting regenerative agriculture actually say, come on guys, we need some credibility. We need to tone down some of the claims. And what is maybe the, the, the best arguments? I think Philip Bave has summarized them very well in this paper of his on a credibility issue for the soil science community around the, the Catra per meal, the, the four per thousand initiative where he shows that if, if you start to sequester carbon, you have the years of carbon accumulation here, uh, years of management, carbon accumulation, you see that there's an attenuation towards a new equilibrium value, which means, as we see on the right of the slides, the rate of carbon accumulation drops dramatically as time goes on. So even though <clears throat> we can store maybe a lot of carbon quickly in the first few years, if we change practices, then the rates of accumulation are going to decline. So what are the main points of critique that we have around regenerative agriculture? We agree that there are big challenges in the, the world. Agriculture faces these serious challenges. But given this huge diversity of agricultural systems, the starting points are so different and the challenges vary over time and space. So simplifying everything down to just a few points is really unhelpful. And there's very little attention given to the starting point and local context. And now, particularly for me working in Africa, where we suffer from extremely poor soils, poor soil fertility, where we need inputs to get agriculture going. We can't talk about sustainable and productive agriculture without actually getting more inputs into the soil in terms of nutrients. Then the idea that everywhere we have to cut inputs just simply doesn't ring true. I think it's a big mistake that all agrochemicals are bundled into one, uh, one component, if you like. Whereas we know that the concerns for, for our health, for the health of the environment between fertilizers, nutrients, which are essentially environmentally benign if used in the correct way, and pesticides, they differ enormously. There's very little attention actually in the whole debate about uh, regenerative agriculture is if we are pushing for less and less inputs, how do we actually develop alternative methods of pest and disease control? And some of the principles are actually a bit contradictory because if we're pushing for zero till, but we have to use less inputs in terms of herbicides, how, how are we going to manage that without mechanical tillage? Yeah? How are we going to manage weed control without many mechanical tillage? So there's some contradictions here as well. And the focus is very, very much on individual farm scales with very little consideration of the broader landscape or of the ecological footprints. And Europe is, is now pushing very strongly within the European policy for regenerative agriculture, for 25% of organic agriculture, without thinking, well, what is the global environmental footprint of consumption in Europe? Because, of course, if we produce less here, it's very likely that we're going to stimulate actually land clearance and changes elsewhere. So we came up with these five questions, uh, which an agronomist should use, if you like, to guide your research. So first of all, what, what's the problem that we're looking for a solution to? What do we want to regenerate? What sort of agronomic mechanism could enable or facilitate that? And then broader, 
if we have, if you like, the technical fix, how can we get that integrated into a practice that is likely to be both economically and socially viable in that context for different stakeholders and particularly for the farmers? And then finally, what sort of political, social, economic forces uh, are driving that new agronomic practice? You know, do we need new policies to actually support it? So personal reflection, why did I initiate the writing of this paper together with others? Well, first of all, I, I was really confused and I don't think I was the only one. It seemed to me that the enthusiasm for regenerative agriculture vastly outweighed the evidence with many unfounded and exaggerated claims. And I'm basically, I'm really allergic to dogmatic approaches of people saying that, you know, this is the only way and you have to follow us. And I think really there are many other important issues in the world that need attention. And Andrew McGuire here, uh, that's a, a, from his blog on the internet, regenerative agriculture, solid principles, absolutely, but extraordinary claims. And if you don't follow Andrew McGuire on Twitter, I, I really advise he's, he, he writes some really interesting stuff. Again, so what is regenerative? Actually, I think agriculture in many ways is regenerative. It's based on, on fundamentally renewable resources, photosynthesis and biological nitrogen fixation. And of course, we, we, we augment that with other nitrogen captured from the air, but again, an, uh, 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 an unlimited resource. And of course, I've, I've focused a lot of my own work around nitrogen fixing legumes in Africa. So I think I can really start selling my work now as a regenerative scientist, should I so wish. One Twitter handle being used very much is this one, sustainability is for your parents. There's a great need among the companies among different NGOs that we've got to go somewhere further than sustainability. Although for me, I'm, I'm not sure, maybe I'm just too old that it's a completely redundant concept. And I'll leave you with this, this cartoon that Philip Bave again used in his paper recently on soil health. We've got these people heading along the road. They come to this junction in the road where they've got a choice. And most of them choose for these answers, which are just very simple, but we know they're wrong. And there they are dropping off the cliff. And here on the right are the people who are picking a book out of the, out of the, the library that they're, they're studying and they're going up this rather difficult hill. And I think in many ways, this sort of epitomizes where we are now. We've got science on the one side, heading off to the right here, grappling with some of these important problems We've got marketism, marketing and, and a sort of populist approach, pushing people off to the left over these cliffs where we really need people to engage with some of these important questions in the world. I'd like to thank these co-authors, Renska, Jens and Jim, who we had a lot of fun writing this paper together. And, and at that point, I'll stop and apologize to all of you for uh, the uh, technical glitch that we had in the middle of that and hopefully we can have a good uh, discussion now. That was wonderful. I think the technical glitch was completely forgotten by the end of that. Um, and now we have plenty of time for questions. So thank you for that, uh, for the start with your talk. I think it broadened all of our uh, understanding of the paper further and invited uh, the questions we have listed here in the Q&A. Uh, so I'm just gonna read them off. Um, Remember that you can uh, thumbs up the ones that you want and they'll move them to the top. Um, if you have any more questions, write them into the Q&A uh, uh, icon that you see at the bottom. Uh, so Matt Heaton um, asked, uh, he said, there seems to be an advocacy challenge uh, around regenerative agriculture uh, where some of the loudest groups appear to be less concerned about empirical evidence how, as researchers, do we lead the way uh, in ensuring that the important aspirations of generative agriculture are not diluted by pseudoscience? I mean, uh, I think this is one for the audience at large to, uh, for us all to answer. You know, what is our role, if you like, in, in, as scientists? Um, I think our role as scientists is to actually make sure that we, 
but we hang on to the, the truth. You know, I, I, I struggle very much in some of the discussions because I feel that very often that my own work is, if you like, pouring cold water on people's heads. And you don't want to do that, yeah? We want to encourage people to think about such issues. We want people to engage. So we don't want to just dismiss things. But how do we make sure that we maintain a form of credibility that we don't simply actually go so far down the line and then everybody says, ah, we can't take these guys seriously anymore because they're just not being honest, yeah? So I think that there's a matter of trying to bring some scientific rigor into the discussion and the debate. And that I see very much as, as our role. I think, um, yeah, I think that's absolutely where where the conversation is going, um, and hopefully that we are going as a young, uh, younger audience of scientists. Um, Lindsay was asking, uh, what is the attraction or motivation uh, for many of these influential companies buying into the concept of regenerative agriculture over and above sustainable agriculture? Yeah. So Lindsay, yeah, that's a, it's a question that, that perplexes me. Um, I was just, in fact, yesterday invited to a closed discussion with Nestle, with the CEO of Nestle around uh, regenerative agriculture. And as I said, I first heard of regenerative agriculture through Unilever. Um, some of the Unilever bland, br brands, like Ben and Jerry's, are really very, very strong supporters. And I think when it comes to um, the companies, I think there's a feeling that they've sort of, they've been doing sustainable agriculture. They've had the Sustainable Agriculture Initiative. Many companies have been pushing uh, sustainability and, and have been making big commitments to it. And I think it's often higher up in the companies, not necessarily at the level of people doing the sourcing or dealing with, with farmers in their supply chains, higher up in the companies, people say, oh, great, you know, we, we need a new marketing ploy. And very much the, the value of these companies is very much in their brands. So they're into protecting their brands very much. So that there is a huge degree of marketing here. And of course, this is why I think people like those in the Rodale Foundation really get rather worried. And now they've actually got a Rodale organic, uh, regenerative organic agriculture, which Patagonia's already signed up to, which is really trying to say, okay, but it's not just regenerative, we've got to have it organic as well. So, I mean, I think that the, the, the whole territory is becoming more and more blurred, if you like. And maybe that's a good thing, actually, in many ways. Bianca was asking, um, I have observed and received some uh, and sometimes aggressive questions at conferences about why uh, scientists ignoring regenerative agriculture, why are scientists ignoring uh, regenerative agriculture principles? How do we manage to provide a balanced answer without getting hooked into the public argument? Hmm. I'm not sure. Um if all of you have seen it, but there's some really interesting uh, work been done in New Zealand where basically it had got to the point where there were letters being written. Uh, there was a huge actual, I think, bun fight going on between scientists and farmers around claims made for regenerative agriculture, but where they came together and they wrote a very long and detailed report where they tried to actually bring together scientists and farmers and other stakeholders. Um, together with policymakers, and and I think in many ways, what we've got to do is is avoid, if you like, avoid throwing too many stones. And of course, um, you know, I, I make some fairly strong uh, critique in in this talk of people around some of the claims being made. And I think we have to call out people when we think that they're not being honest about what's possible and where the science actually can't back up their arguments. But at the same time, we need to try and engage in a productive way, which where we, we don't end up just, just basically throwing stones at each other. And I think it's a real, a real problem, actually. Um, maybe if I could just take a, a couple of minutes just to tell you another story, and that's 
we've got at the moment, we're heading towards the World Food Systems Summit. And many of us have been involved in writing background papers for that because it's really a, a, a big opportunity to, to get food discussions on the table. The high level of panel of experts has come up with 13 principles of agroecology that they're trying to get everybody and every nation to sign up to in a very political way. And most of those principles are actually fine. I mean, they're basically about collaboration, about working together, about being good for the environment. But one of the principles is reduce inputs. And I absolutely can't accept that that's true for every system everywhere. And, and when I get into discussion with them, that can become very, very difficult and very vehement immediately. So, I mean, we put examples on the table, but there are people there with very strong political stances who are really trying to push a very strong political agenda. And I think it's really important for scientists like yourselves to engage in those discussions and not just to let it go by. Because otherwise we find ourselves overwhelmed by people who are more in the, in the lobbying uh, uh, side. It seems to change quite a lot considering just maybe a couple of decades ago people were pushing for more fertilizer to be applied throughout Africa to now be. <clears throat> I mean, I think Africa is, is a, for me, is a, a, well, obviously it's where I devote most of my work, but I think it's a really important uh, example because obviously within Europe, where I live in the Netherlands, I mean, we do need to reduce the amount of, the number of animals per hectare in the Netherlands. I mean, there are simply too many animals for the environment to cope with that burden of, of nitrogen. And I think things do have to change. So depending on where you are on those scales of intensification, we can maybe reduce inputs and still maintain yields. At the other end, though, we need to build inputs in order to provide food for people and to really engage with uh, the issues at stake. And it's really dangerous if we get these blanket principles coming in, which actually would interfere with some of those initiatives. We have a question from Kibet. Um, what is the distinct difference between conservation agriculture and regenerative agriculture? I think many people would say that conservation agriculture is a, is a perfect example, if you like, of, of, uh, of regenerative agriculture. But then of course it depends on, on how you do it because as, as I used in one of my examples, if you actually reduce tillage and you don't have herbicides, then you need to use more mechanical weeding or burning, and maybe they aren't very regenerative practices. So, I mean, I think that conservation agriculture sits in a rather difficult place uh, uh, at times with this broader regenerative debate, but there is a big push within the regenerative agriculture community for reduced tillage approaches. That's really very clear, yeah. Um. When in, uh, Milan was asking, what are the major barriers to the adoption of generative agriculture practices by African smallholder farmers? I suppose my, my question would be, why should they worry about the term regenerative agriculture? Yeah, I mean, I think that uh, I, all of my work really is around the diversity of farming systems around the world. And, the need that within each of those farming systems and this is what we come up with in our paper you know okay what's the problem what do we need to try and regenerate and in, in Africa it's really trying to regenerate soils if you like soils that have been used without inputs for many years and there we we simply need actually judicious use of fertilizers together with good organic man matter management what we call this integrated soil fertility management is I think a perfect approach where we use all the best of our knowledge of biology and chemistry, if you like, to come together to actually build soil fertility, to build productivity. So I think it's just a matter of escaping, if you like, some of the ideological stances that, uh, that sit behind all of this. Yeah. Do you think that in most of those atmospheres, the extension agents have the support and the, I guess, information to be able to help farmers on that more integrated science level. Well, I mean, I think, I think the, I mean, if we really want to go into discussion of Africa specifically, I think the big problem there in many ways is that, that there's simply not enough government support and advocacy for smallholder farming. 
Um, if you compare it with what's been done in Asia, particularly say in India, where you have a whole raft of different policies in terms of building rural infrastructure, providing social safety nets, um, adjusting input output prices to make agriculture profitable, having strong extension uh, uh, and research to support smallholder farming. I think that whole environment within which farming uh, takes place in Africa simply doesn't have sufficient support. And, and in, in fact, in us ending up having debates about whether we should be pushing regenerative or agroecology or organic or integrated soil fertility management. I mean, we really need, need to get on with the job and, uh, and you know, tackle the problems. I think that's uh, really my, uh, my stance. We have a question from Helen Hayden. Um, will regenerative agriculture hype cause it to burn bright and then fade, like the term biological farming, uh, because it lacks substance? I think, Helen, I think that's a really, really interesting question. And, and one that um, I think, you know, it's to sort of watch this space. Um, I think it's taken off in such a strong way and it has such strong advocates um, also among the farming community that regenerative agriculture is, is likely to burn bright for quite some time. And I think that particularly with the way that so many different companies have, have come on board, if you like. Now you can argue that what they're pushing are very, very different forms of agriculture depending on who you talk to. But in some ways I find this blurring of boundaries if we have a common goal, which is to produce in a way which is good for the environment, maybe actually, and I, I've, I'm sort of changing my mind on this all of the time, maybe this term regenerative agriculture helps us a bit because agroecology has become very much um, a movement with such strong political advocacy around you know it's now it's not just a form of agriculture it's a social movement if you look also at the definitions in the scientific literature it's very hooked up with food sovereignty with via campesina and and in the in the latin america ngos like that which are quite extreme ngos in some ways and so i think maybe regenerative agriculture can take some of the wind out of the sails of of the agroecology movement where it's become politicized so in some ways, I start to feel maybe it's quite useful, although um, it's still confusing. Yeah. <clears throat> On the political side of things, uh, we have a question uh, specific to Sri Lanka. Um, Sri Lankan uh, president recently banned the chemical farming ab abruptly. He is asking everyone to produce compost um, or organic fertilizer. Scientists and agronomists are voicing their concerns about a possible food security issues and collapse of rural farming economy. Regret regrettably, scientists' voice, uh, voices are totally disregarded and the president is summarily, stubbornly holding on to his decision. Um, yeah. The questions are, um, have you seen or heard of any community or country uh, transforming from chemical uh, farming to organic? Um, what are the dangers you foresee yeah. in that? Uh, and are there any possible ways to mitigate negative uh, fallouts in a very short period? Now, and I think this is, this is exactly why we as scientists, as a scientific community really need to be active. Because <clears throat> this is a, a clear example, if you like, of the sort of populist politics that we're, uh, we're in, in, in the world that we're living in at the moment, where where basically very short term um, political goals seem to take uh, precedence over any form of, of credibility in terms of knowledge. And I think that this is uh, in the Sri Lankan context is extremely frightening. Um, I think, yeah, what can we do? I mean, uh, Lakshman, uh, by all means, call on your international colleagues to see if we can help in some way in, in representations to your government. But the whole idea that everybody should just make compost defies all of our farming systems understanding because we simply know that the amounts of organic matter that are available, even if we're as circular and as recycling as we can, 
it's really it's really going nowhere. I mean, we we cannot maintain the levels of productivity need we need to feed the world's food population purely on on recycling and on organic agriculture. So, I mean, I think your your comment there about you know government policy going this far is is extremely frightening, to be honest. We have a question um, from Eric Hutner of ACIR. Um, the general problem is about dialogue with the public on scientific issues. Similarly to how we can address climate change, we as researchers need to start with an appreciative perspective, recognizing people's concerns, values, uh, et cetera, uh, with empathy and support, then move to opposing practices supported by facts and evidence. Should we call yeah. out charlatans uh, or just ignore them? Sure. Um, I think that's that's a really perceptive point, and I fully agree that we need to engage. You know, for instance, uh, one of the debates I got into is we had a, a, a debate. You can see it online. Um, <clears throat> we have a an organization that we're part of called Table Debates, tabledebates.org. And I had a discussion with um, with a scientist from the Rodale Institute where we, we debated issues around um, regenerative agriculture and you try and do it exactly in a respectful way. I think it's incredibly important to engage. I, I guess the point that when you, you know, about do we need to call out charlatans, <clears throat> when I see large companies actually making investment in those practices like this one of uh, you know a fungal based compost where <clears throat> in a discussion I was in a private discussion actually with the company the claims were made that soil carbon was increased by two to three percent within uh, within two years you say sorry this is just not not possible and, it, and and then you know when the claims go way beyond what is feasible I think it is important to call people out but I do agree that we're, we're better off trying to avoid getting into slanging matches, uh, <clears throat> um, which are just going to actually cause more polarization of debate. Because often uh, in, in this populist world, very short quotes are taken very much out of context and then used against us. And so the more we can have um, a direct dialogue, I think, and, and rather than uh, having that, if you like, as a separate people making comments, if you can bring people into the same room or onto the same platform to discuss, I think that does give us the opportunity then to present, if you like, the scientific arguments in a measured way. But I, I do take the, the point very much that uh, was, raised, was raised um, by Eric, Eric Hutner, that, that we have to be careful of, of getting into this uh, slanging matches and throwing stones mode. I think that's a really important point in that table conversation there's a link to it on the event right event so if you get a chance if you're interested um please feel free to uh look back at that or please do uh later uh after this talk uh rodrigo uh asks does reg the regenerative agriculture approach uh is it better suited to small and mid-sized farmers and not broad acre large enterprises um, I guess it, it depends what you mean, <laughs> Rodrigo. Um, many of the strong advocates on the internet that you find for regenerative agriculture, and there are a lot of testimonials out there, are actually from um, livestock farmers uh, farming thousands of hectares in, in Australia or on big farms uh, in, in New Zealand or the United States. So I think it... Um, yeah, it depends which bits you, you're talking about. They're obviously practicing forms of rotational grazing that they find useful. And I know colleagues in South Africa do find some, some benefits from some of the approaches to um, rotational grazing, but it's not the, the mob grazing approach of, uh, that's promoted by Alan Savory, uh, to be honest, yeah. I think that that ties into uh, another question that we had that was going along with Rodrigo's question that was essentially hypothesizing the opposite and wondering whether smallhold farmers were being left out uh, for the um, 
for a, a movement that's targeting more large farms and corporations? It, it's a really interesting point because <clears throat> part of the um, advocacy, if you like, around regenerative agriculture for many of the, the companies is very much tied up with their commitments to uh, going uh, zero carbon emissions within their food supply chains by 2030. So many have, have set this target, we're going to be zero carbon in our supply chains by 2030. And then they think that actually by promoting regenerative agriculture, that can actually work as an offset for many of the other emissions that they're actually incurring as well. So I think for many of the corporations, the regenerative agriculture discussion is very much tied up with these, these broader commitments to the environment. Mm -hmm. And um, and yeah, uh, the smallholders get left out, I guess, and, and unless they're part of, of that situation. Are, are we ever gonna be in a place of recompensing smallholders in terms of carbon credits? There've been attempts in the past for agroforestry schemes in, in Africa, and their attempts now starting again uh, to re recompense smallholders, but it's really very, very difficult to do because, of course, the costs of measuring and monitoring um, often tend to outweigh the costs of uh, the benefits, if you like. And I'm in discussions I've been having, I mean, people are talking about uh, the price of carbon credits going up to something in the order of um, $100 a tonne to actually make things viable. And I think currently they're running at around 20 to 30. But at one point, after many, much enthusiasm, they dropped to two to three. And so, I mean, when you're making long term commitments, you need to have long term policies that can actually back them up. Otherwise, you have farmers undertaking practices for the long term and then losing out in a few years because the markets changed and the priorities have changed. I guess it really is a timeline thing. The companies get an immediate boost from these policies and the farmers may be, be a very long-term investment sure. benefit. Yeah. Um, we have another question from Bianca. Um, I think we have time for these last two questions. Um, we can wrap it up from there. Um, Bianca asked, should agricultural and science and soil scientists be trying to reach wider audiences by making YouTube videos to explain their work? Um, or is this not a good use of our time? I guess it depends on who watches YouTube. Um, I'm, I'm, I really don't know. Um, I think we have to use all of the, the power of, if you like, of, of, of the media um, where we can. Um, until actually, uh, until the lockdown, I, I was uh, completely linked out. I wasn't on LinkedIn, I wasn't on Twitter or anything. And it's only since we've been locked down that I started to engage. And I find actually that there's a lot of interesting stuff happening at times that I pick up actually from, from Twitter feeds. And uh, this guy, um, Andrew Maguire, would be, a, would be a good source for you, among others. Um, and I found as well, certainly when our regenerative agriculture paper came out, that was tweeted around and I saw it actually picked up in Australia and it actually went very quickly around in Australia as well. So I think, I think social media can be very helpful. I can't comment on, on whether YouTube videos really make the difference, um, but I think it's about engaging with the stakeholders you work with and in your environment and making sure that you engage with that debate using all of the, the forms of media that we can, to be honest. Yeah. And our last question um, comes from, oh, I guess we have a short one after that, but um, from Lindsay Bell. Um, Many of us are interested in improving sustainability of agriculture. Uh, so can we use this obvious interest to garner political, social, and institutional support? Well, let's hope so. Um, and I think that in a sense, Lindsay, that's where I've come round to. It's, um, you know, we started off really when I saw the whole regenerative thing going, I think, what on earth is this? Why on earth are people talking in these terms? This doesn't help anybody. It's just adding more uh, froth, if you like, to a really, uh, an already really confused debate. 
But as you go on, you see that there are many, many people who have, uh, actually share common goals in terms of, uh, of, of boosting the environment, protecting biodiversity, you name it. And if we can garner that in a way that we can engage with people and say, well, yeah, we agree with you, but you know, let's knuckle down and sort out what are the real key issues at stake that we need to address. I think that would that 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 could really, yeah, we can use these these the momentum, if you like, and the the enthusiasm and the interest in a very productive way. And I think that's what we've got to try and do. And you know, I mean, I, you might, I mean, Lindsay, you know me you might be amused to hear me saying this because I'm often seen as being somebody who's really out there and really critical of things. But you really do recognize that, that there's a big opportunity here. And, and like I say, I'm, I'm in all sorts of discussions and debates since this paper came out at high level with policy in, in Europe, but also with many of these big companies. And you know, dare I say it, a big company coming to me and saying, look, we just committed 3 billion to regenerative agriculture. Can you help us define what it is? And you think, is that not the wrong way around? But yeah, of course, yeah, okay, let's work together and see how we can use that in a productive way. I mean, I think that's that's a really good uh, point to maybe close the discussion. So thanks for that. Well, one, one final thing, and this is completely my own bias and I'm gonna put this question in. Um, Eric Hutner asks uh, if you could share the uh, a link to the cartoon as well. Um, we have the paper, um, but the last paper and cartoon quoted in the presentation. Um, uh, so the paper is already quoted on the Eventbrite uh, page, uh, but as somebody who likes to uh, sum up all of her research is comics, I appreciate the power of a good comic strip to, for communication. <laughs> um, sure. But with that, um, I would thank you, like to thank everyone for uh, participating and coming today. Um, and Dr. Giller, thank you so much uh, for making time on your morning or evening uh, to bring this conversation uh, to the forefront um, of our minds um, and what we're talking about. Uh, for those of you who didn't get your question out or uh, wanted to discuss further, uh, we're gonna provide a link for if you wanna become a member of RAID and then on our website, you will have an actual um, discussion uh, specifically for regenerative agriculture that you can continue the discussion and talk directly at each other uh, and really create your network around uh, these provocative ideas. Um, but with that, um, uh, don't overlook, I guess, a good idea getting out there even in a less than well-known paper. Um, and thank you all for your time. and. Sure. Well, thanks very much for the invitation. And I think I've got huge respect for uh, the agricultural research that's done in, uh, in Australia. So a great opportunity to engage with you. Uh, and yeah, hope to visit again in, in the next few years sometime. Cheers. Cheers. Thank you.